So welcome to CCS 325. My name is Andrea Fedi. I'm Italian. I was born in Florence. I did my PhD at the University of Toronto and then I came to Stony Brook in 94. This is my 29th year at this university. This is a class that I created a few years ago, around 2016, when I moved out of European languages and into the department that was then cinema and cultural studies. It's a class about culture and society. The official bulletin title is Culture in Context. The context is society and the focus is technology. But of all technologies, we are focusing on the automobile. Because the automobile, in my view, is the first modern individual technology. It is modern in a unique sense because it was the first technology for which the primary function the utilitarian use didn't drive access to the technology, desire to have the technology consumption of the technology. Because for about 20 years, between 1888, which is the official date for the history of the automobile, for the start of that history, August 5, 1888, birth of Benz, wife of Karl, drives 66 miles in Germany, first long distance journey for a car, accompanied by her two sons. We'll, we'll see a picture of a monument celebrating her uh, deed that day. But for the first 20 years, between 1888 and 1907, the car, was less than you would expect and more in surprising way. It was less than you would expect because for the first 20 years at least cars were famously unreliable. Even though by 1907 cars were being produced on a scale of tens of thousands per year, per major area of circulation. And it was more because the car was being sold, was being introduced to the public in a way that is very similar to what in more recent times has happened with the latest paradigm shifting technology, the mobile phone. And I'm not referring to the mobile phone as it was introduced in the late 1980s and 1990s, the bricks that you still see in films from that era. I'm talking about the next step in the evolution of that technology, when not only you can avail yourself of the primary utilitarian function of being able to call people from everywhere, but you have a device on you that is connected to the internet. At that point, it's not about the simple juxtaposition of the user and the technological device. It's a life-changing kind of technology. It's not having something on you that allows you to call people, communicate with people via text, etc., and also consult the web, do a Google search, etc. It's your life dimension that has changed. Now your life is the life of an individual who is essentially connected to the network. And in fact, there is no denying that you most users have established a symbiotic relationship with the phone, right? To the point where you cannot go 
a few hours if survive psychologically more than a few hours if the internet is down, if the network is down. And a lot of people keep their phone in their beds, right? Not even within reach, but with them, like a puppy sleeping with them. In the same way, the automobile was introduced to society and sold to, com to consumers as something that was less and more of a utilitarian device. Surprisingly, you find little mention of this is an instrument that will allow you to move more quickly from point A to point B in the literature about the car. You find that, of course, but it's not the primary call, the primary attractive for this technology. What is instead is this idea that the car adds a new, previously unknown dimension to life. It's not just life plus mobility, life plus access to something that allows you to move wherever you want compatibly with the existence of a network of acceptable roads. It's life within a dimension, the speed of the car, that was unknown before to the experience of the individual. We'll talk about trains. Trains were introduced and reached speeds much higher than any car by the 19th century. However, you don't experience speed in a train, right? It's like being in your living room. There is nothing of the physiological and psychological experience of speed, which is the same even today, right? You take a super fast train in Europe or Japan, you don't really experience speed, right? Same as with planes. You're up there, but you don't feel the difference between 500 miles and 800 miles. You might, if you were flying with a military pilot on a fighter jet, right? But not for the regular user. So the primary idea associated with the car is that you buy the car to experience it. To live this experience of being on a car, driving or riding on a car, at a speed that was never experienced before with things such as ships, horses, carriages, etc. And this experience is primarily pre-rational emotional. It's something that comes through your senses, is from the gut, from the ass, right? Because the ass sits on the car, and I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Rush, directed by Howard, and in there, one of the main characters, the characters uh, fashioned after real Formula One driver, Niki Lauda, after pointing out to a series of problems in the car of a woman he is falling in love with. And when she asks, how do you know that my car has all these problems? He says, because God gave me the ass. <laughs> and I can feel the car here, right? <laughs> the car is one with the body and with the pre-rational part of the mind. That is the experience of the car in the literature and the films that we will examine this semester. So I'm going to introduce a series of pictures to comment on some of the main ideas in the class. And then I'll show you where you can find the website of the class in case you haven't seen or received the email I sent a few hours ago. 
I'll show you where to find the syllabus discussed, some of the aspects of the class. If there is time today, we'll have a short activity. Otherwise, we'll do it on Thursday, okay? And again, tell me if my voice is not loud enough to go over the noise or if I'm screaming like a man, <laughs> okay? So give me signs, I'm not, not subtle uh, facial reactions. Just, just raise your hand, just tell me, uh, and I'll adjust. How are we doing with lights? You're able to see the screen clearly enough, even with these lights. Okay. So, we start with the representation of a train. Actually, if you're talking about technologies related to transportation, we must admit that with this image, we have skipped two steps, right? Can you tell me what's the first step? What's the first revolution in the field of transportation in the history of humankind? Don't, don't say walking, right? Let's move out of the Garden of Eden and, and creation, but in terms of something that can be assimilated to a technology. invention of the will, but actually we have to do go back a little bit, right? Because there is something else that comes before the will. So with the will we are 2500, 3000 BC or BCE, but we have to go back another 1000, 1500 years and mention something else. The domestication of horses, right? First revolution. And that it is a huge revolution, right? Because we think nothing of horses now, right? Mm -hmm. That's it's, it's a, a, a pastime for fancy people. Uh, it's a sport, the equestrian sport, right? Something that is practiced on Long Island for, for sure, but you think it's marginal. However, up to World War II, horses were essential to transportation, right? 1943, the German armies that are still fighting in Russia are, st are still occupying most of Central and Western Europe and, and trying to get out of Africa are still moving about half of their men and supplies with horses, horses and carriages, right? And you have, as, as modern people, as people who were born in this century, right? Probably, most of you. You have no idea how strong horses are and how capable they are. Take four horses, strong horses, right? Made for work, and you practically have a track. Four horses can pull a track, a long track, a semi, okay? We are talking about this kind of strength. And can we think of a symbiotic interaction with the horse? Of course, right? There is a symbiotic process. Horses are worse than dogs from that point of view. You really have to be in, aligned with them. You really have to establish an empathic connection. Horses uh, are, are nervous, are temperamental, Right? Unless you connect with them, it's hard to work with them. So there is some kind of symbiosis. However, what's the difference between the symbiotic relationship interaction you have with a car, with a phone, with a horse? With the car and the phone, those devices become an extension of yourself, right? The phone is an extension of your social mind, essentially. The car is an extension of your physical body. 
your individual body, right? That, that's why the train is so different. different. <clears throat> In the case of the horse, you have another sentient being. And even though users imagine their devices, including cars, as separate from them and they talk to them or they curse at them when they break down, it's much different with a horse. And if, you, if you've never touched a horse, you can think of a dog and how different the symbiotic relationship with a puppy can be. So, we skipped over the horses, even though horses were an established means of transportation, everything was working perfectly. When the car comes out in 1888, most people think this is just an exotic pastime. In fact, you know that driving a car, riding on a, uh, on a car, is classified in which category among human activities? during the first 20 years of the car's history. Can you guess? When you define going out with your car as a passenger or a driver, people call it what? In which category? It's not entertainment, but... Luxury? Luxury? Not even. Well, of course, it's, a, it's considered a, a luxury item, right? Especially because for the first 20 years, Basically, even a small car is as expensive as a small car, uh, uh, house or, or apartment. What about a joy ride? Yeah, not, not there yet. Okay, a leisure activity? A leisure activity? Close. We're getting closer. But it involves the body, right? That's the idea. Traveling? Sport? Sport. Cars is listed over and over again, thousands of times in documents, articles, books, among the sports. Because even as a passenger, it's considered a physical activity. To the point where we will see how, in the medical field, the car will be seen as a, an instrument for therapy. And there is, among many, articles, a pamphlet of about 50 pages by a French doctor from 1906, I believe, that explains how he has cured a series of patients of various ailments using the car. And the pamphlet is all about the application of the automobile to medicine, to modern medicine, right? So, we mentioned the horse. What is the other thing that should have been mentioned if we think of great shifts in the evolution of transportation? Um, boats. boats, right? Sailboats. Sailboats are the foundation of ancient empires, right? The League of Greek Cities, the Roman Empire in many ways, even though the Roman Empire will become, will come to rely on their fleet only by the end of the third century BCE, so about 450 years after the foundation of Rome. But then think of the colonial expansionism of the 14th and 15th century, of the 15th and 16th centuries, the creation of the British Empire, etc., etc. Now, here we are with the train. And when you look at this, what is missing from this early illustration of testing a train in England in the 1820s? Well, first, let me tell you, very little apparently is missing from this, right? Everyone's there. You have ample space reserved to the landscape, so the train is placed within a territory that is already structured and organized, right? So if you look in the background, you have the bell tower of a church. So you have 
a village of some kind, then you have a factory and smoke coming out of that factory to remind you that steam engines were first responsible for the creation of the Industrial Revolution, right? And then you have this uh, system of tracks, which is very elaborate, this archway, right? So everything reminds you that you need a powerful infrastructure to run a single train. Then if we want to complete the list of who's there and what is represented in here, you can clearly see that this is a social event, right? There are people on horses looking up, possibly wondering whether the horse will be replaced by the train. You have plenty of people on these cars. And in this case, the cars are open, as it was the style for about 20 years for trains, right? So I'll go back to the effects of the car, cars being open. You have a group represented nearby, right? So you have a stronger presence of the middle classes, perhaps the upper classes, right? People in hats, uh, decently dressed, right? So they represent the people in a position of leadership in society. And then, of course, you have this ridiculous situation where a horse is actually going in front of the train to alert people or to send away, to shoo away animals that might be uh, uh, in, in the path of the train. What is, again, one thing that is missing, egregiously missing, conspicuously missing from this representation. Right, yes, because that was the style. But in terms of the theme of the representation, if this is supposed to be the representation of a big revolution, imminent revolution in the field of transportation, what is being stressed, what is being glossed over, neglected, not emphasized? Workers on the train? Yeah, the, there is probably, this is probably an engineer from the way it, it is dressed, and, and this might be uh, the person working the coal. Of course, trains will have a, a larger crew, uh, usually for the next 100 years, well into the 1920s in order to run a train, especially a commercial train uh, transporting goods, uh, you need to have every other car, at least a man pulling the brakes at a signal from uh, the edge. You want to try again? Uh, also, I don't see like the good part of it. it's just people. Yeah, there is people, just people. Um, there's no like sense of like speed in the in bingo. The horse in front of it. Yeah. It's very static. It's transportation, but it's the most static representation that there can be, right? Yes. I'd also like to point out, um, yeah. and like back then, they, yeah, there would be a horse to let everyone know, whereas today we have those uh, train lights, and then you have the, what do you call them, the, right. the, line, the lines coming down, and then the train goes But that, all, that is only at some points along the lines, right? right, right. Intersections with, with the roads. This will be replicated later on. You may be familiar with the regulations in England uh, up until the first few years of the 1900s, whereby whenever entering a town, a car had to be by law preceded by someone with a flag on foot, signaling that the car was going by. Okay, so 
subjected to the speeds of a man walking leisurely, leisurely, uh, slowly in front of the car. But it's static. It's static because the emphasis is the train is a new mode of gathering together, right? All the passengers coming together for this kind of travel was unique as an experience, as opposed to carriages, uh, coaches that uh, could take five, 10 people, 15 at the most. And as I said, the speed was not to be felt really by people experiencing the train. So in the case of the train, as opposed to the car, the primary utilitarian function was evident and was emphasized every time. There, was, there were some references to speed, especially as long as the cars were open uh, and, and you find some uh, funny uh, concerns by potential passengers, people worrying if I'm traveling on a train that is going 30 miles, 30 miles, I'm not talking about fantastic speeds. Uh, on an open car, will I suffocate because the air is whizzing by so fast that, that I cannot capture any? The air is passing me. But otherwise, trains getting closed, people don't really experience speed, and the train is something, of course, revolutionary, right? Something that will change society, will change the industrial uh, network, the military network, will have a strategic value during wars, etc. But it's not this modern technology. It wasn't then, it isn't now. Modern in the sense that provides a new dimension to the individual whereby the individual has not simply acquired a function they didn't have or that function is being potentiated but it's a new thing altogether. My life with the phone is different completely from life 30 years ago without a phone. It's not just my life plus. No, it is different. My social life at least. And of course when you go review this presentation, you find the captions where I placed these, some of these concepts in a clearer format, and also some links if you would like to explore and know more. Now, I've included this, I've skipped the sailboats, but I've included this hybrid steamship, which relies on sails whenever possible, but also has a steam engine with the big wheels, the big paddle, and is able to cross the Atlantic Ocean in around 1840s. Again, in terms of representation, we can immediately notice how the presence of sailors and passengers on board the ship, on the bridge, is not conspicuous at all, right? Because once again, we have a powerful technology that, for example, will revolutionize society in reference to not only the transportation of goods, but this time through the second half of the 19th century, migration, right? Migration will be based mostly, especially migration to the US, but even migration to Central America, to South America, will all be based on the availability of ship fares on steamships, right? So it was an industry altogether that of transporting people that would relocate to another country, but it is the same thing. It's a technology that requires an infrastructure, requires a crew. I can avail, avail myself of this technology for transportation, but it doesn't change me as an individual consumer, okay? In terms of speed, before we get to the car, we have to talk about electricity. Because it is electricity that insinuates the idea that speed of a certain level, of course, in the case of electricity, it's almost immediate transfer, right? Changes things in a dramatic way. And the first effect of this can be seen 
with this beautiful piece of furniture, a telegraph, a five-wire telegraph, right? Before the Morse code, this is the most ingenious thing, right? Because you have five wires on a landline transporting electrical messages, and those messages are up and down, left and right. Because by moving these needles, these five needles, you can point out to any of these 20 letters. Of course, the system doesn't allow for, with five, you cannot have more than 20 letters. You, you put in the essential letters, you replace some, and you have a message that is understandable. And even a child can actually uh, operate this machine, piece of machinery uh, after 10 minutes, uh, as opposed to Morse code that requires special training, right? You, you understand how it works, right? You, you see the lines. So if you want to send a B, what do you do? What do you move? Which needles do you move up and down? To send the letter B, you operators. So you have your keyboard here, you have five levers uh, for the needles, and you have one to send a message, to send a stop. We want to be. The third one, how? We're not there, right? And so we're saying left, right, right? Up and down. First, in that direction, and then? Three times. Three times. Could it be like the third time? No, one, two, three. Look, B leads here and here. It's all about triangles. Oh. Right? With two messages, with two inputs, you can combine with up and down. You can point out to a letter, right? So if I move this here, if I move this here, they meet at the B. So that's how, in a very simple way, I don't have to memorize the uh, Morse code, I, I can do this. But what does it mean is that I have electricity, I have this machine from the 1840s, and I can send out content, information, news, everywhere, everywhere there is a landline or a line at the bottom of a sea, a lake, an ocean. And even though I'm using electricity over wires, in fact, the, the word for telegram during this period is wire, I, I received a wire, uh, even though I'm using electricity traveling fast enough over copper wires, things are a bit slower because the signal tends to fade over a longer distance. So not only I need a landline, eventually let's say Beijing and Paris will be connected, right? By the 1900s, you can send a telegram from Beijing, China to Paris, France, because there are landlines connecting those places. However, along those lines, you have also relay stations because after a few hundred miles, the signal would fade and uh, become undecipherable. And therefore, someone has to receive the message and send it to the next station. Please. Uh, I noticed that there were some letters missing. On the yes. You, with this system, with five needles, you can only cover 20 letters. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you exclude some letters and you do the best, you replace uh, some. For example, the C is missing, right? I think this is a G. Now I would have to, to look at the computer with better resolution. Yes, it, it is a G. So the C is missing and uh, what, what else is missing? The Z, right? Uh, so you just replace some of the letters. And you know that your brain is able to interpret, even if you don't replace those letters, the words will come out clearly enough. So this machine gives the idea that there is a new dimension to life, that 
almost immediate speed can change what I think of time and space, right? So much that by the end of the century, newspapers enjoy a bigger circulation because they can convey the global range of news relying on telegrams. Any place connected via tele telegraph to another place where newspapers are being produced can have the news from that area and have them available for printing within hours. And this is Bertha. This is Germany. This is the place, the piazza, where Bertha Benz had to stop to refuel during her journey of 66 miles in the company of her two sons, Richard and Eugene, I think. Okay. And the question would be, so she stopped for refueling, but this was the first journey of a car? Was there a gas station here? And of course the answer is not, and you find it in the caption, you find the answer in the caption, she went to a pharmacy. Because a pharmacy, drug stores in general, would have benzene and alcohol used to erase stains, right? And she didn't need much in order to uh, uh, refuel the car, even though the car was not very powerful, was, was slow, uh, speed were under the top speed of a horse. Horse can comfortably travel at about 10 miles per hour, can be pushed to 12 or 15. Uh, and even though the, the car was small, uh, uh, the, the engine was 4.5 liters. Someone had a question? Yeah, um, I don't know if you said this already, but is this like, a, is this like the first Mercedes Benz or something? Yes, the, her, her husband was Carl Benz, okay. right? She put her family's money into Carl's uh, factory, uh, but she also spent a lot of time at the factory. And that's why, most probably, there are a lot of fictional narratives about the events. However, Carl had created the first car three years earlier, and of course tried the car on factory grounds a number of times, but they never ventured at a considerable, such a considerable distance uh, in the real world. And justifiably so, because Bertha Benz, who was not just a driver, but had some engineering skills, had to fix the car in creative ways because she experienced problems with the brake lining and other mechanical issues that she was able to stop and fix by herself. The reason why I included this, and what I like about this, well, the sculpture is kind of cartoonish. It looks half Mary Poppins, half Bertha Benz. However, what I like is that they didn't put the car. They just have these pipes, because it gives you the idea that the materiality of the car disappears when you're speeding. Right? You don't feel the heft of the car because you are going allegedly so fast. And going fast changes, right? At this point, going 10 miles an hour uh, on, on this car feels fast. And if you've ever experienced a, a driving or, or riding as a passenger on an antique car, I'm talking about something pre-1920, open cockpit. It feels 10 times faster and 100 times more dangerous. And I was talking about the senses. All your senses are involved because you smell the benzene. The smell of benzene and oil is very strong in an engine from this period. The noise can be very strong, very loud as well. The car shakes, shakes in a way that not, no carriage had done before. So through your body, all these sensations combined with 
the visuals, the landscape going by at speed, give you a new, the sense of a new experience. Uh, About a day, like, several hours, yeah. yes, yes. Because she had to stop and because the car was, as I said, very slow, uh, the conditions of roads were paved decently enough, but they were made for uh, carriages. Uh, so it, it was kind of a problematic uh, proposition until uh, uh, macadam roads, which were similar to as asphalt of, of today, uh, became more popular in the 1900s. Okay, so this is the beginning. August 5, 1888 is the beginning of the history of the automobile. And as I said, within 60 years, the car will have an immense, as a technology, will have an immense impact on society, right? This image of a highway circa 1960s in America, I think it's Texas, but I don't remember exactly, gives you a sense of the deep impact on the landscape, on society, right? Because American economy comes to be dependent on the mobility of the workers in so many ways, right? And in fact, even when you think of the Great Depression, what is the kind of image that you have in mind or images? Hobos on trains, poor people on the road, or poor people with a car or a pickup with their belongings, right? By that time already, you have this notion that there is a crisis in one area and you relocate people with different means of transportation, including a car, right? And so the economy, is impacted by this. Social customs are impacted by this, including the sexual revolution, right? And in terms, the, the, the car as a product itself is so successful that within the consumption market, one out of five dollars during this decade, the 1960s, is being spent on cars. So cars represent 20% of the consumer's economy, okay? So, very big. And of course, suburban areas, exurban areas like this one in Suffolk County are being introduced because cars exist. And, and you can see the connection, right? Because these suburban, uh, the suburban plan, the typical suburban plan is exactly like a parking lot. It's a place where you sleep and keep your car, and then, come morning, you jump on your car and go. What else is there to do? Other than for kids to play before TV and video games took them out of the road. Uh, Dr. Phoebe? Yep. Um, I just have a question about the, what do you call it, the Benz. When did Mercedes-Benz come in? Well, Mercedes. during the uh, first decade and the second decade, uh, uh, car bands came together with other investors and partners, and they created Mercedes Benz. The Mercedes name was first assigned to a sports car they made, and then became the name of the company. Uh, Carl died in the late 1920s. Bertha went on to live until 1944. So, jumping to the present time, this is a video from maybe a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, and it's all about the obsession with speed. This is the presentation of a, an American car, the NSC Venom F5, that is able to reach speeds of 300 miles per hour comfortably, without modification as a stock car, right? Of course, what's the use of that? Again, the car is not about the utilitarian purpose, right? The car can be an accessory. What cars do I want to be seen around, right? What car represents me? 
when I present myself in a public place. And the car is about the experience of being in the car because it feels different to be being in this kind of car as opposed uh, to a Honda Civic or Toyota Corolla. No offense to anyone here owning one. My car is a Fiat 500, love it. It's the third Fiat I've had in my life ever since I was 19. It's an iconic car. Kids smile at the car. Adults smile at me because they say, what's this six feet one wow. dude doing in, in this hand? Is that you, Dr. Think Was that, that you? No. <laughs> no, it's not me. I would have had the oh, Italian okay. flag. Okay. If anything, I would have carried a different flag. Okay. And talking about the car being a completely different technology, industrial and artisanal at the same time. Here is Automania at the MoMA Museum, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, last year. It was an exhibition devoted to the car. The car as an option of art, but not because some artist took the car and put it there and said, this is my piece. No, no, it's a car taken from the dealership, from a collection and placed there in the museum, saying car design is a form of art. And this is quite unique. The car you see here is a Cisitalia, is one a part of the permanent collection of the MoMA, together with a few other cars, for example, a Formula One Ferrari from 1990. Right? This is from 1946. It's considered a classic because of the lines. Because the lines are so harmonious, because it's an harmonious combination of form and function. And you can click on this and see a few more pictures I took. This is the Formula One car in the hall of the museum. Of course, they change it. Sometimes they have it on a wall but that's part, permanent, part of the permanent collection. And this is the courtyard where they had a few more cars. And I've included this, of course, because what's unique about cars in reference to design is that you have, for example, this car, first designed in 1963, right, by the grandson of Ferdinand Porsche, the founder of the company. This model is from 1965. But Porsche has been making the same car for the last 60 years, right? And the one time they tried to get away from it with the 924 and 928 and 944 models, it was like Coke. They had to go back to the original design because the consumers didn't take it well, right? Citroen DS is another marvel of design. Right? And look at the reaction of people looking at this. These are people looking at a car, right? But you can see in their eyes, it's like looking at Michelangelo's sculptures. And talking about iconic cars, this car has been made in various formats ever since the 1930s and with retro designs of various kinds up to now. Uh, of course, now they're making the electric version, which in fact is the version I have. It's, it's an electric Fiat 500. And it was in the movie cars, in the series cars, etc. And this was part of the collection, the exhibition at the MoMA. It's the representation of the kidnapping of a woman in a Swedish poster from the early 1900s. But it's the industrial version, the automotive version of a painting by Titian of the abduction of Europa, who is a legendary princess, Zeus, Jupiter, the, the god of the Greeks, comes transformed in a bull and kidnaps her, invites her to ride on the bull and takes her away. In the modern myth, the car replaces the uh, godly animal, right? And look at 
commercial posters from the past. Again, this idea of the speed, right? It's like frames on a film and look how the speed is allegedly changing the shape of the car, shape changing the materiality of the, of the experience, right? And of course, drivers themselves, this is Toulouse-Lautrec representing the driver, is like a new species, right? And that was the idea, that the car provoked, produced an anthropological shift. So, in evolutionary terms, either as a human, you were able to adapt to a society that relies on the new technology, or you go extinct as an individual, as a class, as an ethnic group. Those were the questions, those were the general issues that were being debated 120 years ago in reference to the car, and it's so apparent, right? that this is a non-human, this is a different kind of human, and of course, it's dressed in Ford, because if you drive, the, the air makes you very cold, but it's a common representation that you become animalistic when you drive the car, right? Yeah. And, and they were familiar with road rage from the very beginning. One of the earliest pictures of a racing car, of course, you don't have the kind of cameras you have now, so it's difficult to frame the car correctly. And because of the exposure, you have this, the, the deformation of the wheel becomes uh, elliptical, but that gives you this sense of speed, right? And look also at the passers-by, how they come out in this. Let me come closer to the conclusion and then I'll show you the, the website. We saw cars in art museums, but of course there are hundreds of car museums at this point all over the world, right? So many even here in the United States, many more in Europe, especially in countries such as Germany, Italy, and France. Mercedes-Benz opened their museum kind of late in 2006. I went to see it a few months after they opened. They have 100, 160 uh, cars, seven or eight floors. And item number one there was what? A horse. One-to-one <laughs> -one reproduction of a horse with fake fur. And underneath a plaque saying, reproducing a statement by the emperor of Germany saying, yeah, the horse will stay, cars will pass. People will get bored. They're fashionable now, but eventually people will get bored and abandon them. And from this museum, from this collection, just a couple of months ago, this car came out. The museum now, it's kind of disappointing because it's full of, full of replicas. You may not know, but some of the cars were destroyed, others were sold. They don't have that many original cars in there. This was one of them. And mind you, at this point, companies such as Ferrari, and especially Mercedes-Benz, have entire units working just on providing spare parts to car collectors, right? Some spare parts cannot be found anymore and they make them and they sell them to uh, their collectors. They provide support and maintenance also. And, um, and they also make replicas for amateurs of vintage cars. For example, even the car that Bertha Benz drove has been made in about 100 uh, uh, items uh, in the production line by Mercedes and sold at a very happy price. So this car fetched $143 million, which was about double the previous record that was many years ago for a Ferrari GTO, although some of these prices are kept hush-hush. In this case, we know, because Mercedes-Benz said, we'll give out the money to a charitable fund. 
And this was, in recent years, a previous record-setting car, another Ferrari 250 GTO that went for $48 million in California at an auction. Of course, you know that there are movies, very successful movies about cars in recent times. The best example would be this one. And I have included two videos that um, I invite you to see. The first one here is about Christian, the character of Christian Bale talking about the perfect lap. So driving is not, driving a race car is not about winning, it's about this mystical experience of the perfect car with every turn, every shift, gear shift taken perfectly. You can see the video at home, it's about a minute. I'll just show you this other video because it brings us back to the theme of the physical experience of the car that goes through your mind and straight to your guts. And this is Carol Shelby, the man responsible for the GT40 project. The GT40 was this car, which you can see at the Simeon Museum in Philadelphia, that won Le Mans in 1967 and 68 also, I, I, I believe, defeating Ferraris. There was a backstory that you find in the movie that Ford was about to purchase the Ferrari company. An initial step agreed upon was that Ford had to buy a big building in Bologna owned by Ferrari as part of the deal. Even after Ford purchased the building, Ferrari went back on the deal and said, I'm not selling to you. And of course, didn't give the money back for the building. So Ford was very angry. And they said to Carol Shelby, give us a winning car with a Ford brand on it. And this is the president of the company, member of the Ford family, trying this car with Carol Shelby. So it's, I had no idea I could feel this, right? Feeling the speed is the key to the experience. And although it is played almost in a farcical way, that is the tr true, it's supposed to be the true emotion of the Henry, the Henry Ford II, the, the son of Henry Ford, the founder of the company, saying, I wish my father was here for this experience and for the physical experience of speed in this kind of car. So, I'll stop here for now for this part of the introduction and I'll continue briefly, although you can look at the entire thing and read the caption, they're not heavy reading, and I'll just discuss the website and the syllabus for the next 10 minutes. Okay. So, as you've seen before, as you've seen from my message, we are not on Blackboard, we are not on Brightspace, uh, I'm using the servers of the Notion company, uh, because you can have the professional plan if you are a faculty or a student, and Notion is very flexible, uh, wonderful little app. And therefore, the actual direct link is unmanageable because it simply points out at a corner in one of their servers how you go to the website if you don't have a bookmark. In. Either you go to andreafedi.com, my personal domain, and then from here you see self-portrait done on an iPad and the link to the automobile and society which will take you there. Or you can type after andreafedi.com CCS 325 and the redirect will take you there as well.
and we'll take you to the portal. The first few times you'll be asked to click on the link to confirm and then the transfer will be automatic. In here, the portal, you find the core concepts of the class and then you find the sections of this wiki. The presentation that I use is under week one of lectures and readings. I have included a news and announcement page where right now you find a welcome message. And if there are events of interest for our class on campus or off, I will uh, circulate them. For example, this weekend at NASA Coliseum, they have their first, first for NASA Expo of electric cars. And in September, uh, there is a uh, vintage cars, vintage Italian cars, uh, Concours d'Elegance here at Stony Brook. It has been going on for many years and other events. I'm thinking about also if you participate in any of those events, we can talk about extra credits if you put together a short report. On this page as well, I can go anywhere I want. The calendar is made of folded weeks. You have to click in here to see what is going on every week. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm on Zoom between three and six, and you click on the link to go to Calendly and see when I'm available if you want to see me on Zoom. You go here, you don't need login. You don't need login for anything. And if you want to see me tomorrow, well, I only have two spots left two spots on Friday, but on Monday, you can select any of those spots and then you receive the link, it goes on your calendar, etc., etc. very practical. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, right after the class until 5.30, I'm in the Melville Library, third floor. Friday, I'm also on Zoom, but only until five, and then I start drinking. <laughs> Not this early in the semester. Okay. And depending on the week, I'll, if there are any changes, they'll be marked in here as well. Of course, for example, Labor Day. But this Wednesday also, there is, instead of 3, I start at 3.30 because I have a previous meeting. Very practical. Meaning I can be available more times because I'm simply working on my computer. I'm not waiting for you in a physical room or, or being idle, waiting for students to uh, come in. And the most important thing for some people, the syllabus you find here, the list of some of the books that will read, well, will read some of these books, some excerpts, will also usually so on Tuesdays, we'll alternate. On a Tuesday, I'll we'll introduce a reading and the themes of that reading. The next Tuesday, I will analyze, select passages from that reading. Thursdays, every two weeks, we will watch and talk about a film and uh, uh, watch some scenes and analyze the themes and the visual style going from Silent films, although we will not start with silent films, we will start with a classic, The Love Bag, Kirby, The Love Bag, the original Love Bag. Uh, I was five when it came out. Um, and going up to what? Oh, Bumblebee, right? Which is like the modern, the best modern version of Kirby, not, not the remake with Lindsay Lohan, which is quite forgettable. And um, let me show you the compo great components. 25% is attendance and participation, but most of it goes to written assignments. There will be five, maybe six written assignments during the semester, okay? And details will be provided. Um, I've already sent out to about half of the class the Google Docs file for the assignments. You'll do the assignments on a file that I created in Google Docs. 
it is shared only by me and each individual student. So I can see what you're doing. You can put their questions in the comments, right? And I receive a notification and everything is there. I can also later on put your participation rate there if you want to know how you're doing or your overall average up to that point. Your final project will go there, okay? The presentation is based on the final project. Can be done on Zoom or as a video recording. For the project, we do some basic research on the digital archives, looking for interesting short stories or articles about the automobiles in uh, documents from the early 1900s. And you can already go there to that page. You'll even find two videos from the previous, from the past years about the project if you want. But come October, I will spend a week on the project and talk about the methodology. And there is a final exam with four or five essay questions, mostly based on the texts or the films, meaning the themes of the films, right? You don't have to memorize the films. There is no textbook. All the readings will be linked in here. Some will be publicly available because they are copyright free. Others will be stored on my Google Drive, and you'll have to use the Stony Brook login. However, keep in mind that depending on how you work for the assignments, the final exam, etc., it might be a good idea for you to rent some of the movies. Some of the movies, again, are free. They're available on YouTube because they're copyright free, all of the, all of the silent movies. Some uh, are available on Amazon Prime, and if you're a Prime member, you don't pay, and others might require a small expenditure if you want to prepare more carefully, more thoroughly for an assignment for the final exam. Okay, so we still have five minutes to spare for questions, or you can scream awful things at me <laughs> and let me know how terribly I did. Again, I'll appreciate it. Um, is this doc, the one that you shared with us, gonna be for the first assignment or all the Every, every assignment will go there. And, and of course, that file will remain open until the deadline for the final project. After December 9th, I think it's the deadline for the final project, what is uh, Yeah, it's December 9th. After that, every file will be closed for editing, remain open for viewing, so that you can, after that date, see the grade and the comments for the final project. You'll also find there your final grade for participation. And again, it will be available, visible only to you and me. Um, but the rest of the semester is not like any kind of Dropbox uh, uh, area. I don't know if it is called that way in Blackboard. It's not like if the deadline for an assignment is October 1st at midnight, the file will be closed. Of course, I can see when you posted it, but as far as the assignments go, I can be flexible as long as you have a plan. Meaning, if you leave a comment saying, I couldn't finish the assignment tonight, it'll be ready tomorrow or two days from now, that, that's fine, right? As long as it is reasonable, not two months from now. <laughs> and the fact that you have this Google Docs allows you to work on the final project. It's not the kind of final project you really can do the last two hours before the deadline. You can start with drafts and ask me to review it and leave comments and an idea of a grade. This is more or less an A or a B or a C. What you have now with suggestions. So since we don't have a midterm, don't just forget about the class until the very last moment. Use the time to have a preemptive assessment evaluation of the project because if the project is good, then your presentation is supposed to be good, right? And the presentation is you coming on Zoom or recording a Zoom video, putting on the screen the documents you found and explaining why this document is relevant, what is there that is relevant for the themes and the contents of class. 
and you'll see the kinds of documents I'm referring to. It could be someone describing their first experience of being on a car. It could be someone describing the experience of being on a car at high speed. Or it could be a short story, and there are many during that period, of two people falling in love because of the automobile, right? And so the romantic effect, or even the erotic effect, of driving the automobile as a form of physical stimulation that prepares for a different kind of excitement. Okay? More questions? Hi, Dr. Feeney. Um, Let me also pull out the attendance. I should have circulated the attendance earlier, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find the... You know, I'll the, try now. Over the Google Doc. I, I, I can't find the Google Doc assignment. I haven't shared it with all of the class. Oh, okay. Only about half of the class. I'll do the rest by tomorrow morning. So, yeah. Is it due the next class period? No, the first assignment is due Wednesday of next week. Okay. I will illustrate on Thursday, but you already find it uh, under week first, right? So if you go, let me show you as one last thing before you storm out. If you go to lectures and readings, of course, you go to week one, and here you find a list of topics, but this is not, these are where the details are. Week one, you find the general introduction, presentation I used myself, presentations I will use during the rest of the week. Here, by Thursday, you will find the YouTube video of this class, and here you find the assignment. You find the reading with some focus points, and you find the written reflection. And as an alternative, you can watch a short movie, about 30 minutes, which is available for free to Prime members, and write a film analysis. And for both, you find description. So, of course, I will explain, but already, everything should be clear enough. Okay, and then you can ask questions and clarifications. 